Okay, yeah, you're up. So just uh, no, it's actually there. So just just press the arrow key. And I mean, no. yeah, okay. So it's time to start. Yeah, okay. Okay, so today we'll start the actual 12 of reciting and understanding. So last week we talked about uh, lots of committed tasks like the uh, semantic and segmentation and classification, localization, objective detection, and some others. Um, but today we are going to ask another question like what's going on inside the convolutional networks and what kind of features uh, these networks are looking for. So till now we think the convolutional network as uh, some little uh, black box and we can uh, see some images is coming in and through all these layers like the convolutional layers, redo layers or some other nonlinear layers and uh, on the other side we end up with some sets of the like simple things like the class scores or some uh, bounding box. So but the question is that what are all these uh, layers in the middle doing? So, and can we try to get some, uh, gain some intuition for how the convolutional networks are working? Yeah, so here is, uh, so first I think we can just look at the first layer. The first layer, first convolutional layer consists of some filters, uh, like in the XNet, the first convolutional layers consists of a number of the convolutional filters, each has maybe shaped by 3 by 11 by 11. And uh, these convolutional filters get slide over the, all the input image, and we take inner product between uh, some chunk of the image and uh, the weights of the convolutional filters. And that gives us our uh, outputs. So uh, then after the first convolutional layer, so in AlexNet, we have uh, 64 of these filters, but now in the first layer, um, because we are taking a direct inner product between the weights to the convolution layers and the pixel, if the image can get some sense for what these filters are looking for by simply just visualizing the land weights of these filters as the images themselves. So for each of these 11 by 11 uh, by three filters in your XNet, we can just visualize that filter as a little image box. So well, the three channels give me uh, give us the uh, red, green, and blue values. And then because there are 64 of uh, filters, we just visualize the 64 little 11 by 11 images, and we can repeat this. So we can look, just look at the weight of convolution wheels at the first layer of AlexNet, and here some example like the ResNet 18, ResNet 101, Res and DenseNet 121. So and you can see what these filters are looking for. So for you see that a lot of things for the like the ages, some different colors uh, and various positions in input. And we can see here like the pink and green and uh, blue and uh, orange. So uh, it's similar to the, it's actually similar to the human visual uh, systems in some very early layers. So, and we can draw this same visualization, not just for the first uh, convolution layer, but for some intermediate convolution layers. It, it is actually a more complex uh, and less interpretable, but uh, here is uh, just an example from the demo, the ComNet JS. so what's on. And the first layer is seven by seven convolution with 16 filters, so at the top, we just visualizing this first there first layers and their weights for the network just like we saw in the past slides. And second layer after some convolution convolution layers, some relu layers uh, and other nonlinear operations can receive 16 channel 
input and uh, that's a uh, seven by seven convolutional with 20 convolutional filters. And because you cannot just uh, visualize this uh, directly as image. So for this, we can just uh, spread out this seven by seven plans of the filter into some 16, seven by seven grayscale images. So these little grayscale images here just show us that uh, the weights in one of the commission filter, the second layer. And, the, and here just the 20, there are just 20 outputs from this layer. So you can see, uh, maybe it's too small, that there is some special uh, structure here, but you cannot clearly describe what uh, exactly what, 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 what they are, right? So uh, because these weights are not just uh, uh, connected directly to the first layer, to the input, uh, it connect to the first uh, convention layer. So it's just to give you a visualization of what type, what type of the activation pattern after the first layer can make the second layers uh, convolutional to maximally activate. Uh, but it's still not uh, integral, so we still need some more techniques to get a sense of for what's going on in the uh, intermediate layers. So besides just look at the first layer, we can also look at the last layer. So we have maybe thousand of class scores uh, that are telling us what are the predicted scores for each of the classes in our training data set. So here we can also focus on the last layer of convolution convolutional uh, network in this example, we can record the 4096 dimensional vector for each of these images. And uh, one thing we can imagine is trying a nearest uh, approach. So the left on so the left on the left, uh, it shows some examples. Uh, we have a nearest neighbor classifier for the CIFAR 10 data set, and so you can find the image that look quite similar, depend on the pixels. Uh, but there are, there are also some uh, problems in this classifier, like you can see at the second layer, at the left there, uh, it is a dog, but right, you can see dog, cat, and some other animals. So the result is not that good. But so now we can uh, use the same type of visualization, computing, and visualizing these nearest neighbor images but not in the uh, pixel space. Uh, you should in the nice 4096 dimensional feature space. So you can see on the right, first column shows us some examples of the images from the test set. It is quite different from the pixel space, like the second line, you can see in the second line, the elephant uh, just uh, stand, stand on the left in the image, but you can see the second picture, this uh, elephant in the right. And that, uh, for these two pictures, their pixels are very different, but in the feature space, uh, they are very close. And another angle we might have for visualization, uh, visualizing in the last layers by some concept called the dimensionality reduction. So something like the principal components analyze, uh, which let you take some higher, high dimensional representations like this uh, for southern and 96 dimensional features and then compress it down to just a two dimension. So you can visualize this uh, feature space more directly. Uh, there's another really powerful algorithm called the TSNI. Uh, TSNI standing for the <laughs> distributed stochastic Enabling embeddings, which is a more powerful non-linear dimensionality reduction method that people in deep learning often use. Uh, so here is just an example that what uh, Tisney can do on a minus data set, the handwriting for the handwriting data. Uh, so the Tisney can compress the 28 by 28 grayscale image down to two dimension and then visualize each of those digits in this representation. So just uh, in the middle. You can see one, two, three, four, five, about mm, nine or 10 classes uh, represent the uh, numbers. So, uh, no, sorry. So you can see the nature cluster appealing, which corresponding to the digital set. 
And here is a similar type of visualization. So where, the, where we apply the Tisney uh, dimen dimensionality reduction techniques to the features from the last layer of our trained, trained image net classified. So what to be a little bit more concrete here. Yeah. So what we have done is that we just take a large set of images. We run them all through our convolutional uh, network, and we record that final 4060 dimensional features vector on the last layer for each of those images, which gives us a large uh, collection of uh, these 4096 dimensional vectors. And now we apply the Tisney dimensionality reduction to compute to sort, sort of the compress that 4096 dimension feature space down into a two-dimensional feature space and lay out a grid in that compressed two-dimensional feature space and visualize what type of images appear at each location in the grid in this two-dimensional feature space. So by doing this, you got a very uh, rough sense of what the geometry of this term feature space look like. You can see in, in these two pictures. So uh, actually, the picture is just uh, it does some cluster by the features. Like the in the corner, maybe you cannot see. There are some similar pictures. And this uh, coordinate just comes from the Tisney algorithms. Sorry. Yeah. What is the left picture, right picture? I didn't understand. The, OK. So what's the left picture and what's right picture? Left picture is more. Oh, that's it. I see. Yeah. I think the last picture is. Sorry, I need to download this picture. So. Yes, I choose which one. Yeah. Different data set, I think. Yeah. And I'll show on the sorry. No, it's okay. It's just okay. So here another thing you can do for some of these intermediate features. The activation maps of those intermediate layers is kind of the interpretable in some cases. So again, in the example of XNet, uh, maybe you can choose the uh, convolutional five, the com five features for any images. So now it's uh, one to eight by thirty by thirty dimensional tensor, but we can think of that as a uh, one hundred twenty eight different thirty by thirty two degrees. So now we can go and visualize each of those uh, 30 by 30 elements slice of the features map as a grayscale image. And this gives us some sense for what type of things in the input are each, uh, each of those features in that convolutional layer is looking for. But uh, here, I don't know why this black grid has maybe 16 times 16. I think it's okay. So, so for this picture, it is a person just sitting in front of the camera, and uh, most of the these intermediate uh, features are kind of noisy and there are nothing on in it. And uh, but there's here in the green box uh, highlight. It seems that it is acting activating on the uh, portions of the feature map corresponding to this people's face. Yeah, but I can figure out. <laughs> so another kind of useful thing we can do for visualizing the intermediate features uh, is visualizing what types of patches from input image cause maximal activation in different uh, neurons. So here we just uh, can pick the COM5 layer from AlexNet again. And uh, remember, each of these activation volumes at uh, COM5 gives uh, 20, uh, 128 by 13 by 13 chunk of numbers. Then we will pick one of the this 128 channels. Maybe here we just uh, choose the 70s. And now that uh, we, we will do, do this, run many images through this convolutional network. And then for each of those images, I'll record the 
features uh, in the COM5. Look at the parts of the feature maps that are maximally activated over our data set of image. And now, because uh, because this is this is a convolutional networks, so a layer, so each neuron has a small receptive field in the input. Just visualize the patches from the large data set of images corresponding to the maximal activation of particular features in the particular layers. And uh, we can sort these patches, patches by their activation. So here is some example. Each row, we will choose one neuron from one layer of a network, and then sort these patches from some large data set of images that maximally activate this one neuron. It can give you a sense for what types of features this neurons might be looking for. Like the first row is maybe a neuron is just looking for some circle things. And uh, you can see some, some neuron may just looking for some tags. Uh, Second, uh, like edges, looking for edges. Yeah. And another uh, experiment we can do that. And one question. I mean, these are all always from the first layer, right? No. I mean, after the input layer, because? In the media layer. So you can see that choose the COM5. Oh, COM5 is the input layer. Yeah. In previously, I've seen in the same lecture, I and now you say that. Yeah, you missed the first couple of minutes. You yeah. talked about that already. Yeah. yeah. So it was earlier that you could use the, the, the input layer. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe in the, the first layer layers, you can. Yeah, but they say that if, if you take these things from the intermediate, it's not no longer interpretable. And, uh, but yeah, it doesn't seem to be because uh, yeah. for the first layer, we just uh, show the weights. And here, no. So these are actually many, many features that you can't show the number. And then those that right. activate on that neuron. This is this. I understood. I, I think that what you what they're saying is that the max pool, whatever the max pooling layer selects out of the feature map, to show for multiple images. I guess that's what they're doing. No, no, no. It's, no. Not, the, it's, it's not the given, given an image uh -huh. which of the image activate the most, regardless of mass, uh, I, regardless of mass pool or not. Mass pool is not uh, one of the. Uh, yeah, not, yeah, is I mean, not because the, the, no, because the comp feature map right. is the whole image, right? Yeah. So, so they and are only, only then some part of them will light up. So they basically just crop it out and show. But I, I think that's what they're doing, right? Yeah, I think the yeah. neuron. Because it's not, so there's not a mass pool from the uh, feature map. Yeah. Yeah, yeah feature map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then they just like infer which source that does it come from, and then they just highlight. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, out of the several feature maps, well, some feature map will light up, and that's the issue. Uh, so for a particular feature map, which cell will just light up? Right. Oh, for a particular feature map, they always select, select the same. So they send through all the images mm -hmm. to the network, and then they look at uh, for this particular neuron, which, which cell will just light up. So from there you can see like what sort of ingredients that you can So like this neuron detects in particular a circle inside. So how do you select any neuron? It's not a neuron. Yeah, different neurons, yeah. Different neurons, yeah. Neurons, yeah. Different neurons so represent neurons. each each row. Oh, each row is for a different neuron. Yeah, yeah, a uh, different channel. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so they're 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 cross. Yeah. So those are, those are the, the the filter just for that particular thing that the receptive field. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so I think the idea is um, the comps layer have different feature maps, and the, the different feature maps are sensitive to different, different things. Different yeah. things. Yeah. So, uh, and they are always sensitive to that different thing. Yeah. So, uh, a yeah. Yeah. yeah right. So another experiment we can do that uh, come from the this uh, this paper. Visualizing and understanding the convolutional networks from the ECCV 2014. So it is an idea uh, of a. Uh, it is an uh, idea of the, of an occlusion experiment. So we want to figure out which parts of the input image causes the network to uh, make its classification decision. So what we'll do is take our input image. In these cases, uh, maybe an elephant, and we will block some part of the block some part of this elephant, uh, yes. Uh, and uh, input image and just to replace this part with some <coughs> mean pixel values. And uh, run it, uh, run that uh, occlusion. 
occluded image through the network and then record what is the predicted probability of this occluded image and uh, slide the patch over every position and then draw the heat map showing what was the predicted probability output from the network as a function of, well, did which part of the input image to be, uh, to be occluded. And the idea is if when we block out some part of the image uh, and if that causes a network score to change, uh, to change, then probably that part of the input image was really important for this classification decision. So like the heat map means some uh, red place is important region. Some red region is very important if you it's block this. It's a heat map of the probability yeah. Yeah, it is similar to like the ablation studies we do with feature based uh, machine learning, right? Yeah. You just ablate various features and then you try to see which feature contributes to yeah. most. So, another related idea is the concept of uh, saliency maps. And uh, because we want to know which pixels in these pictures, in these images, are important to the classification. So, here we just use the dog as a uh, Example, so we can just compute the gradient of the predicted class uh, score with, res uh, with respect to the pixels of the input image. So if we wiggle that pixel a little bit, and then how much will the classification score for the class change? So it can find which pixel is matter for the final classification. So we can see the outline of a dog here. So you can find the shape of the dog. So I think it makes sense. Some other example like a uh, dog, some, what's this, uh, fruit? <laughs> what's, I can Yeah, it's a fruit. Yeah. So uh, someone may think that uh, they can use uh, sensory maps to do the segmentation um, without a sufficient, but it can, it is not that practical. So it is much worse than the network which just uh, designed to do the segmentation work. Uh, yes, so it's. See, but it looks really good, right? What? I mean, you, you mean it's not very good. Yeah. But it looks good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but here, because you use the grab card. Oh. Just use this, uh, another, like the oh, because they, image they processing. Oh, because treat it as a seed. And I use graph cut. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's, uh, algorithms it's a in the algorithm, I think. Yeah. Image processing. Yeah. So another related idea is about the uh, guided back propagation. We want to know for one particular image, instead of looking at the class scores, we want to know uh, pick, we want to pick some intermediate neurons in the network and ask again, so which parts of the input image influence the score of the neuron in the network? So you could imagine that computing, uh, you know, the silency map for this again, that rather than computing the gradient of the class scores with uh, respect to the pixel of the image. So you could compute the gradient of some intermediate values in the network with respect to the pixel of the image, and that will tell us a uh, which pixels in the input image influence that value or that particular neuron. So here, uh, using some normal back propagation, it's, it's, all, it's not bad, but turn out that there is a slight tweak that we can do this uh, back propagation producer that ends up giving some slightly cleaner, uh, nicer image. So that is this idea of guided back propagation that come from the paper, also this paper. So here, detail is not important, but just the way you change the way that you back propagation through a ReLU or non, other non-linear. Non so and only back propagate positive gradients uh, through the ReLU. So you are no longer computing the, you know, the, the true gradient instead. Instead of that, you are kind of only keeping track of the positive influence through the entire network. So when you do the guided back propagation as opposed to regular back propagation, you tend to get much cleaner and nicer image that 
uh, tell you which part of the input image that influence the particular neuron. So again, so here you can see this picture again. So we will see the same visualization of the maximally active activating patches. Now, in addition to these maximally activating patches, we have also performed the guided back propagation to tell us exactly, so in the patches, which part of these patches influence the score of the neuron. So you can see the, uh, the shape left and the right, they have the um, same features. So this is a kind of useful tool for the you know, synthesis. Yeah. So here it's about visualize the CN features. So welcome to our partners. So so far we've been talking about um, uh, keeping the image the input image fixed and then um, kind of understanding the CNN by keeping the <laughs> input image fixed. So uh, now we can think of it in a different way because at first we were looking for like patches of the image that uh, would correspond to the maximal activation of that neuron. So now we can actually um, think about like changing the input image in order to fit the, uh, in order to maximize either the class score that you want to get or like the, uh, the activation of one particular neuron in some intermediate layer. So um, this, uh, this equation has two parts. So the first part is where you're trying to uh, maximize the thing that that neuron or the class is looking for in that whole network. And then the second part is the regularizer. So uh, if you don't have the regularizer, what you actually get if you just try to maximize the activation or the score is actually uh, quite a noisy image. So you can't really get anything out of that. So the point of this regularizer is to um, make it make the image more natural. So there's a few ways of um, methods of regularization that people have tried. So. Um, so the first thing you do when you're doing, okay, so this is gradient ascent. So then you can draw a comparison to gradient descent. So gradient descent is the typical, um, you optimize the network's weights and then you try to uh, get uh, get the best uh, weights to for the network. But then to, for gradient ascent, you're trying to, um, you're trying to, uh, you're keeping the network fixed because that the, the network is what you're trying to understand. And then you're uh, changing the input pixels. So uh, this is uh, how it works. So first, instead of randomly initializing the uh, the values of the weights in the network, you're initializing the image. So you can initialize it to all zeros. You can initialize it to like a noisy um, Gaussian uh, distribution or anything. And then uh, you for, you compute the current scores of the image, okay, and then you get the. Uh, that you're trying to understand with respect to the image pixels. And then you might propagate to the image uh, pixels itself and update that. So the one way of doing it is um, uh, just a simple L2 norm as a regularizer. So this is uh, it's semantically not very meaningful. It's just a way of um, trying to uh, regularize the pixel values itself in order to um, kind of get some natural looking image. So you can see kind of some shapes. I'm not sure if you can see on the screen, <coughs> but maybe on your computer. Like uh, the dumbbell, you can see some dumbbell shapes. And um, the next one, this one actually, uh, and second way that people try it was to um, Yosh, 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 Yoshinsky. Um, they try to uh, do a projected gradient ascent. So this one is where you're periodically, while doing gradient ascent, you want to um, do some things to the image so that you project the generated image to a set of uh, more natural looking images. So the, like for example, the first thing they do is to Gaussian blur. So this can uh, project it to a set of images that are more spatially smooth. That's why you can get nicer looking images. Like you can see the flamingos in a flamingo image. And then you also want to clip the pixels because like the reason why the images, like the colors are so um, psychedelic looking is because uh, you have to kind of um, constrain the images to zero to 255. So then um, if you do it periodically uh, throughout the training as opposed to only at the end, then you'll get better results. So you, because like the this problem of generating an image is actually a constraint problem. It has to be zero to 255, but then the method 
of gradient ascent that you're using is an unconstrained problem. So it doesn't fit. So that's why you have to do clipping. And then you can also use the same thing, not just for um, maximizing the class score like we did previously, like the flamingo, the ground beetle. You can also use it to uh, maximize the, the activation of neurons in intermediate features. So you can see like um, some, uh, like layer four, the second one, there's a spiral shape. It's, that's what the neuron is looking for. And, um, And okay, so there's uh, there's an issue with the previous ones. Like sometimes, um, sometimes the class, like for example, a uh, supermarket class is um, multimodal. So there's like two different types of images that will fit this supermarket label. So like on the left, you can see it's like uh, images of like uh, produce or like uh, just apples and vegetables, and then that's supermarket classified supermarket. But then below it, there's also pictures of people at the checkout line or like the, that's just a like more macro view of the supermarket and where you can see like the aisles and stuff. But that's also supermarket. So if you can imagine if you try to generate an image just from maximizing the supermarket label, you will get like a conflation of these two modes of um, supermarket. So then uh, this other paper thought about that. And then, so in the initialization of the in of the input image in the beginning, they uh, they do a clustering to um, get the different modes of um, supermarket, and then you initialize it closer to one of these modes. So they have several different initializations, and then that's how they came up with um, nicer looking generated images. So on the left is the generated images, and on the right is the the original image. So it's initialized with that image first. It's initialized with uh, uh, some <coughs> weights, um, you know, some pixel values that are close to uh, the image. Like they do a clustering of the, uh, I think the input images, and so, then so try to get the main of the yeah mode. I'm not mode. sure which average. I didn't oh, okay. read it, but that's a general idea. So that's why it's a multifaceted visualization uh, for each class. So these are some other um, features that they got. Uh, so and the last one is actually, um, uh, the lecturer Justin described it as like a, uh, using a stronger image prior. I'm not really sure why uh, the FC6 latent space representation is a stronger image prior uh, as compared to like the final class score, uh, if anyone has an idea. But um, if you optimize for the FC6, uh, if you optimize for, um, for the FC6 vector representation, instead of the pixel, instead of the input pixel. So this is all the way at the end, right before you compute the class score. And then you want to um, maximize the class score by, and, and like update the FC6 vectors, I mean the FC6 um, values, then you'll get some really nice images. Yep, okay. So the next part is about uh, fully Im images, so like adversarial examples. So um, this is uh, actually like quite interesting. It's like um, so you you you're, you're trying to fool the network <laughs> into thinking that that like one image is like something else, but it looks like that to a human, but to the network it thinks it's something completely different. So you start from one image, you pick some class that you want that network to think it is. And then you keep updating the image to maximize the class, and then until the network thinks that it's another class. So, like, for example, like you can't tell whether like those two pictures of the elephant are different, right? So actually, the difference is so small you can't even see it. You have to magnify it, and then you see that noise. So, but then the network thinks that the one on the right is a koala, and then like for the boat, it thinks that it's an iPod. So this is like. The, actually, there are like a lot of reasons why um, this is the case, and like you can go. Uh, there's a one whole like 1.5 hour lecture on it by Ian Goodfellow. But the gist of it is that 
um, deep ne deep neural networks, they're actually very piecewise linear. So then, um, if you, because of that, then actually, it's actually what it's doing is finding linear patterns in the space that corresponds to the the test and training data. But then, um, let's say a model is like ninety percent accurate. But actually, this is 90% of the data, the data distribution. So if you think about it as like accuracy in terms of the entire space of like real numbers or like all like just generating some noise, random noise data set, then it will become like, like for example, um, Ian Goodfellow tried to try this network that, uh, and it classified like 70% of random noise images as horses. So it just shows how, um, how thin the understanding of uh, convolutional neural networks are. So let's say, uh, because like the, the more you ask the, the network to extrapolate from the known data distribution, then like actually the more, uh, actually the more confident it gets also. Because like um, in a lot of cases, like maybe the African elephant is like 70% confident it's an elephant. For the koala, if an adversary is trying to maximize the class score, the koala might actually be 90% confident. Mm, it's just the way like neural networks are, because it's linear. That's why uh, as, as it uh, extrapolates more, then it will get more confident. Do you guys want to go into that detail more? You can. Yeah. Maybe you, uh, we can discuss about why, why the noise is, is going to be classified very highly confident. Do you guys have any input on that? Um, I read a recent paper on CVP, uh, something called universal perturbations. So, so right now, uh, you, you, you read that paper? No, oh, okay. <laughs> but I, I know. I, think yeah. I read that. Um, that. 17, yeah. So, um, the so the idea is right now the noise pattern is specific to the image, right? But in that case, the noise pattern is fixed. You just apply the noise pattern, and I think more than ninety five percent of the time, it will always change. Mm -hmm. But of course, you cannot specify which class it will go to. I think way it will go to is kind of random. But uh, but but what's interesting is the noise patterns, right, are similar to the just now the psychedelic visualization. Mm -hmm. So do you know why that might be the case? <laughs> uh, because if, if those kind of like uh, fractal recursive patterns, you know, it also looks this way. So, so it means that there must be something, I don't know, yeah. Uh, just for the comment that if you're going to clip it to zero and put a time, anything will look like psychedelic patterns. No, 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 no. Because by psychedelic pattern, I mean they are fractal like pattern, like cell similar. So it is, it's not psychedelic, but they are like structures which are similar to itself within it. Yeah. Recursive kind of, kind of like, you know, circular, circular, then okay. outside there are more bigger things, you know, this kind of pattern. It, it emerged. Yeah. So, um, it and yeah, I mean, do they then why are they just leaving? No, no, the they never. I mean, they didn't, they never ask. So they, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you have internet, you can go and check out what kind of uh, noise pattern that they get. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a huge drawback because, like, then like the uh, the adversary doesn't even need to have access to your model in order to defeat it. Uh, yes, so, so, can... so, and that's also another thing about the universal perturbation, it not only works for one model. Is universal. It works across multiple models, regardless of what models. So yeah. So, so it means that somebody just need okay. to get a filter. Yeah. Put it in front of a camera. So that is like there are like it. standard. Yeah. Like, kind of there are like generic noise patterns, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. That when fit to any model, will make it classified wrongly. Yes. That's the point of it. Right? Yes. Okay. Cool. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and we don't know why this is the case. He has some explanation, but I don't understand. you type it into Slack? Uh, and, uh, and it's true only for continents or? 
it, they only did it for continents. Okay, at least universal now means there's continents. Yeah. Any universal continents. But, but actually, adversarial examples are for any machine learning technique. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. yeah. And actually, I think the um, the deep deep neural nets are one of the most resistant techniques already. Resistant techniques. That's why I wrote. adversary. Yeah. So, adversarial example. We want to create something so uh, 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 <laughs> So you just said that there are neural networks are so brittle and there are so many parameters and there are everything is you just have some certain piecewise linear patterns that make networks classify something as something else. So they should be very brittle, right? Mm -hmm. But you are saying it's the most resistant. No, uh, the if it's uh, if it was trained with an adversarial a, a, uh, adversarial network, so I think ah, right. yeah. So if you are going for generative adversarial network and then you train it, then it becomes very robust. Yeah, I'm not sure how like normal ones compare to other techniques. So. I mean, have you guys seen um, any paper that has the the grand type training, right? The generative adversary adversary path path the learners are not neural networks. No. Uh, I mean, theoretically, the paradigm is applicable to any machine learning algorithm. That's true. Okay. You could have a, a generator and an and a discriminator, any machine learning model. Mm. Uh -huh. So, and why are that paper? Oh, you mean non neural networks? Yeah. Can mm. can, can right? Yeah. It's a general yeah. paradigm. Next research paper. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it's not that. Are you there and I just don't know? Okay. Looking at the paper? Uh, yeah, it's already in the Slack. Slack. Yeah. Okay. If you want to see, you can check it out. Well, can so, I just ask generally the same question they asked in the lecture? What is all this for? All this, oh, yeah. this, what, is, what is the practical purpose of all this? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. The purpose of adversarial networks? No, no, no. Generally, visualizing the understanding. Yeah. The, the whole idea of visualization and, and generation of uh, making network internet images is towards trying to understand what the network is learning. I think, I think the main goal is to improve the network. So, yeah. for instance, now you want to know, okay, for instance, your network is performing not as well as you expected, mm -hmm. and you want to, maybe you try visualizing it, okay, maybe yeah. a car, right? Uh, maybe in a car, we are, wheels are, are naturally too sensitive, maybe. So, so any shape that has a wheel might get recognized as a car. Then you have to do something about this, either, you know, doing training, mass out the wheels or whatnot, you know, this kind of thing. So, so I guess it gives you some insight. I think it's super yeah. similar to what Vicente was talking about last week also. Like they did some occlusion experiment when they covered yeah, so up the, the, the shirt. The skirt yeah. The yeah, so I mean that's how Vicente was able to figure out that their model was like inherently flawed. So that's the kind of... I mean, earlier, in the earlier two lectures, we were looking at high parameter tuning and all those things. And every time you guys kept asking this question, of how do we know, how do we know? And we didn't have an answer at that time, right? So all these are like recent advances where we are trying to move towards those stages where we can like methodically change some stuff and we are able to uh, debug our, our models. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe I asked a bit too early because you, if you go after this, there's this. All those, you know, uh, paintings, generating paintings, you start out and uh, oh, all that side transfer. So okay. the, that also applies a very practical use for such applications. Mostly yeah. <laughs> okay, understanding. Okay, understanding. Yeah. I think but there's also synthesis. I mean, you want to create new, new images or new musical pieces or new scientific papers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it's like saying, you know, Instagram has filters, right? What's the use of filters? Like, mm. Same question. <laughs> yeah. the, the, for fun, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's also justification, right? You, you, you are clustering something or labeling something, you want to be able to explain why it is like that. Right? That, that's the interpretability aspect. We, we hear it all the time in e-commerce recommendation engines, you know. Uh, you like, we think you're going to like this movie, and you're like, why? Uh, I'm not going to show you, you know, a, a 
24 by 24, uh, you know, matrix of numbers, say that's the why <laughs> you're going to like it, right? I have to explain it to you in some way, right? So I need to be able to represent it. And also, I think in certain fields like medical image processing, yeah. uh, explainability is a big deal because, you know, people like to depend on it. So you, you have to be able to explain why the model is behaving in a certain way. Mm -hmm. I think recently uh, a, a new law is drafted in EU. Uh, so if you are going to use a neural network or this kind of architecture for medical image processing, it must be explainable. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you cannot use it, even if the performance is very good. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine if you're diagnosed with a tumor, right? And then you send it to an adversarial neural network, and you say, "Okay, this other picture that's exactly the same to our eyes is classified as a different type of tumor, right?" Then what are you going to say? You guys are crazy. You're using this software and it's that riddle, right? Mm. So. Um, yeah. I mean, basically, you need hundred percent recall in medical diagnosis, and that's that's and every government is going to come up with this law. Uh, you you you, you, will, you you can be okay with a little bit of false positives because false positives just means that uh, I mean for the positive class if you have a false positive it just means that the doctor has to do extra work and then I have to verify and say that it is not indeed a tumor. But false negatives are completely unacceptable. You cannot misdiagnose a person who has a cancer as not having cancer, right? Yeah. So uh, that's one thing. And there are other applications, for example, aircraft control. Detecting a missile that's coming towards you, you are using neural network and you can right? Yeah. Um, another example. Very example. Yeah, it doesn't come to me anyway. <laughs> okay. So there's another um post from Google about uh deep dream. It's, this was more for like towards the fun stuff um but then it's also quite interesting because like um what this does is like uh the gist of it is that you're trying to uh create an image that uh will max maximize a specific neuron in that network so uh the first thing you do is to uh forward propagate the like the 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 image so you start with a random image like maybe an image of a sky and then you forward propagate it to <laughs> The the uh, a layer in the network that you you just choose, you wanna uh, maximize the neurons in that layer. So you uh and then uh this is where the important part is. So at this layer, then you will set the gradient of that layer to equal to the activation of each uh neuron. So um and then after this, now that the the gradient is um, equal to the activation, then you back propagate it to the image, and then you update the image. So what this is doing is that um, this means that the images, no, the neurons in that layer with the highest activations have the largest influence on the input images updates. So because the those will have the highest gradients, it's kind of like a hack actually. Like when you set the the gradient equal to the activation, because you just you just want it to be such that the the network in that particular particular layer maybe is seeing some docs. Uh, maybe it has like uh, two or three uh, neurons in that layer that are most activated uh, in the sky and then they see some dogs in the sky. And then you want to keep on amplifying the dog-like things that they're seeing in the sky. So these few neurons are seeing some dogs in the sky and then you want to keep amplifying it such that these neurons get more and more, um, that, that the image activates these neurons more. So um, actually you can think of it as uh, equivalent to uh, maximizing the L2 norm of the uh, of the uh, images, yeah. No, of the of the neurons, yeah. The neuron activation. You have an input image and it morphs into something. Yeah. Different. Okay. Yeah. So um, the code is like so. It's very simple. It's uh, like what was what the previous slide said. So first you you file propagate and then you set the gradient equal to the uh, the set set the gradient equal to the activation, and then you back propagate and update. But then there's a it uses a few tricks in order to create nicer looking images at the end. So the first one is to jitter the image. Uh, all these tricks are uh, basically for the same purpose, which is to make the the output image look more natural. The it details on why exactly, like the technical explanation of why like jittering the image would create a more natural. Uh, uh, generate the image like uh, jittering is just like moving the image by like two 
pixels and then wrapping it around on the other side. And then also um, L1 normalizing the gradients that you're going to back propagate. I think this is probably so that it doesn't, uh, uh, it's like kind of like uh, constraining the, the update size so it's not too big. And then also to, of course, clip the pixel values so that you can constrain the uh, generate the image to the 0 to 255. And then it also uses a multi-scale processing for a fractal effect. So it, uh, if you look at the code that Google released, it's, um, it, has, it actually does this amplification at several octaves, which they, they call it octaves. It's actually like scales. So you amplify a different scale so you can get a fractal effect of like uh, uh, a motif appearing in the sky that's like small to large. So these are some examples. <laughs> Right, so uh, for this, uh, so we start off with an image of a sky, and then if we go run it through Deep Dream, uh, you can see that uh, certain like weird morphs like animals pop up. So a few of them have been given some names. So the first would be animal dog, and then the snail, uh, camel bird, and a dogfish. Uh, and the reason for that is because uh, this is being run through the ImageNet network, and in ImageNet among the thousand categories, about two hundred two hundred of them are actually dogs. So you can see like like the network will try to hallucinate for for like dogs or something. Just keep popping up. And then uh if you run it in actually a lower layer, uh, like I mentioned earlier, in lower layers, uh things like edges and curves are being de detected. So you can see that the sky actually morph into like some nice curves here and there. Yeah. Very much in which you should think about as scientists, it's like how to do what experiments to do to generate PR. This is the direction we think. To generate what? Yeah. what experiments can we do to generate PR? Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> these, things are, these things are very cool, right? So you just do such experiments oh. and then write a blog post, you're going to become famous. Oh. Oh. And even if you, you can't publish a paper out of it, you still have a blog post and you're famous. Right? Yeah. But you don't get citations. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, because of the in the blog post, you write these are the other papers that we have written, and they will get citations. Right? <laughs> okay, so uh, for this particular image, uh, instead of using the ImageNet network, it's using the MIT Places network. And this is uh, what we uh, call uh, multi scale processing, where we run the deep dream on not just one layer, but multiple layers, and run it again and again on different layers. So, this is the kind of images you can get uh, running a uh, deep dream with uh, multiple layers on, on multiple layers multiple times. Yeah. So, these are some examples. So, for here, you can see like uh, the generic, like kind of like temple uh, shape, like roofs and stuff. So, these are all from the, the MIT papers. Network. Yeah, so uh, next we're going to look at uh, two things, feature inversion and uh, texture synthesis. So these two things are what is what going to give you uh, this thing called style transfer, which uh, I'll talk about later. So uh, before talking about feature inversion, uh, uh, there is paper down here by uh, Verdaldi. And the original motivation for the paper was slightly different. So his motivation was, uh, given a feature vector encoding, uh, to what extent is it possible for me to get back, right, to reconstruct the image? So, uh, <coughs> imagine if I had, I had some function x to give me my feature vector. So I, I had a CNN and uh, at some point in time I get a feature encoding. So this is after several layers. So now I want to say given this vector, uh, can I get back my x? How, how do I get back my x, right? So the idea is to compute the inverse of this like function. But the issue with this is that uh, after several like layers, uh, 
some of the, the low level features tend to get forgotten. So later on, you'll see that uh, if you run this feature inversion on earlier layers, uh, you still see very similar images, but later on, you, you start to see that it uses some things like color and so on. Yeah. So uh, this is actually the, the image itself. So it, takes, it minimizes this loss and adds in this regular, like regularizer. So this loss in this case is actually just the, the Euclidean distance between the two images. And then um, the regularizer they use is actually a discrete version of the total variation regularizer. And this beta over here is a parameter you can tune. Yeah. So um, this is an example of a regularizer that works well with images. Because as mentioned earlier on, uh, just, taking, just penalizing on the L2 norm doesn't really make sense. But in this case, this TV regularizer apparently uh, puts like the images in this like hyper Laplacian distribution, which is more natural. Yeah. So uh, in the paper, they actually normalize this um, loss as well. So instead of taking this, they still divide it by uh, this. So the reason they did this is to fix the range between uh, 0 and 1. Yeah. And then uh, beta is a parameter they tune. So um, this total variation regularizer uh, encourages spatial smoothness. So the lower the beta, actually you, start, you get more features, but they're more spiky. So I think I can show an example later. But yeah, so if you want nicer images, you tend to set the beta very high, but the images get a bit more blur. So for the, for the, for, in the paper, they use a beta of two. The is true, is it fixed? Yeah. Okay, so if you set beta to two, then it's basically based upon one. You don't need to. Yeah. 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 And yeah, you, you okay. Either you are it's exponential or you are taking roots. Yeah. So you can go both ways. Yeah. Okay. Got it. This one can be this is a nine by nine uh, three by three patch, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be three by three. Yeah, it doesn't have to be. So they ran this on VGG, which is all three by three patches. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, there are some learnings regarding that, so I can mention that later as well. Yeah, so over here you can see a uh, feature version being run on different layers. So as mentioned earlier, if you run it on the earlier layer, you can see that not a lot of information has been lost so far. You can still reconstruct the original image quite accurately, but in the in the images later on, you see that some information has been lost, and you can't really get back everything. So it, it's also worth mentioning that uh, this inverse function is not a one-to-one -one matching. So given different random noises, you get back different images. Right. So if your input, I mean your, yeah, your input is a different kind of noise, and then you get back a different uh, resultant image. But you can compare these images and see uh, what are the invariants uh, in these images. Yeah, so uh, they ran this on the VGG16 network, and they also tried a different network, like they tried LXNet, and they realized that uh, in LXNet, the, the images generated have a lot of artifacts. And this, uh, they say, was attributed to the fact that uh, VGG had smaller uh, filter sizes and shrides. So, yeah. 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 According to the paper. Yeah, I also couldn't really figure out. There's no like intuition behind it, I feel. Yeah. Uh, so the next problem is texture synthesis. Uh, so the problem here is stated is simply uh, given a sample patch of some texture, can we generate a bigger image of the same texture? And prior to neural networks, uh, this is, has been like a very classic like uh, computer vision problem. So you get you see these uh, applications in stuff like Photoshop where you have like your mm -hmm. texture brushes and stuff. Yeah. So all your like cloning brush, your clone stem thingy. So uh, one approach was originally uh, the neural flavor approach. So this is not so relevant. Basically, what you're doing is sampling uh, neighboring pixels and just copying one over. And the latest state of the art non neural network version is called a steering pyramid. So uh, I mentioned this because uh, 
the neural network version draws a lot of uh, inspiration from this steering pyramid. So what happens is uh, it looks like this, and then you have different like layers. So these are what we call uh, steering filters. Uh, you can Google the definition. I can't remember off the top of my head. But basically, you collect features of uh, different sizes, and then you apply these uh, steering filters until you get texture that you want. So this filter, when applied to the feature, will give you a stationary description of the image. So this will discard all spatial information in the image, the texture. Because by definition, textures are stationary. Like there's no like speech like you know like this is in a particular place kind of like information. Texture is a is like a feature. Yeah, so so I mean like in this section, how do you know where to draw the box? Right? There's no like place, like specific place. So there's no like grid, there's no grid. Like it could be this way or it could be like here, it doesn't really matter. So that's what we're saying, like where where the, the information doesn't exist in the texture. So, I mean, you can select any part of the image and it's, the texture information is still the yeah, same. Yeah. Right. Why is it a pyramid? Um, this is basically just saying that uh, you, you extract features of different sizes. So your filters have different like sizes and you just apply it over and okay. over. But, uh, I don't know, these are cable filters, right? Yeah, yeah. cable yeah. yeah. filters. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 I didn't really read out all this. So, I just like, like old signal processing stuff. Very <laughs> yeah. really basic stuff. Yeah. I, I think still will come from the fact that the cable filters are sensitive to orientation and skill. Yeah. So the changing of orientation and skill is called skewing. Mm. I, mm. I, I yeah, think. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And uh, these are all linear. So you can see that uh, actually in uh, deep neural networks, you have a lot of non-linearity. So uh, the kind of like strict application of this like steering filters thing is not very straightforward. So uh, with regular um, with regular um, non-neural network approaches, uh, it works on very simple textures, but it doesn't cover everything. Even for uh, steering filters, uh, there's this like whole big bank called the steering bank of filters that generate natural textures, but they don't cover everything. Right? You you don't get to a new texture for any input image. So this is the inspiration behind our texture synthesis using neural networks. So there's this idea of the gram matrix. Uh, so the, in each, each layer of the CNN, uh, you get a c-dimensional uh, vector of, of uh, height h and width w. So, uh, the idea is to take any two of these vectors and compute its outer product, and then uh, average it. So uh, this is actually just the co-occurrence matrix for for the for the gram matrix. Yeah, uh, it's kind of hard to explain. So uh, the effect of averaging these this uh the co-occurrences is that you lose all that spatial information. The the part where uh, we mentioned that. There's no like spatial information in the picture. <coughs> so that's the nice thing about averaging over it. So one thing mentioned during lecture was that uh even though uh you can actually just use the covariance matrix, but computing computing that is actually more expensive. So that's why the gram matrix is used instead. So this is how you compute the gram matrix efficiently. So here are the steps again. You pre-train a CNN on the image net. So in this case, a uh, VGG19. Then you run the input texture forward through the CNN. And you compute the gram matrices at, at the different levels, at the different uh, convolution layers. And then uh, and then you generate, you generate uh, some noise. And you do the same computation. And, and you try to minimize the loss, which is represented by uh, this function over here. So in practice, if you want to get a uh, good like generations, you, you want to sum the different gram matrices and minimize that loss instead of just using one particular loss. So in the case where you use uh, one particular loss, you can see the different effects. So uh, when you use uh, 
the one at the lower layer, you kind of don't get the same high level features as when you use just the higher level layers. Yeah. Uh, some notes about. Yeah. So uh, the analogy to this is where the this um, texture synthesis approach is basically step one where you extract features of different sizes because uh, in the BGG network, you notice that uh, the feature, the number of features actually double. Right? Yeah, they double at each layer each time because you, you do your max pooling. So the number of feature maps double. And then uh, the second step is to compute some spatial summary statistic. It could be anything. In this case, uh, we are computing the co-occurrence of two like points. And the third step is to compute the new image. And in, in this case, because it's uh, it's nonlinear, we can use the same like gradient descent technique to actually obtain that that new image. Yeah. So uh, actually, this technique is is, is quite accurate already. Uh, but the problem is that the more layers you include, uh, the more parameters you get. So it takes a longer time to generate this new texture. So uh, for this paper, they only used the first four layers, and they did the average of the first four layers. And that gave them about uh, 177,000 parameters. Uh, another thing you could consider is to do some form of uh, dimensionality reduction. So you can use uh, both PCA or TCNE to kind of like reduce the number of parameters in it before you run through the gradient descent. So uh, this idea can be applied. So so what you want here is to, to sort of like get some sort of texture out, out of the artwork. And we can combine this with along with uh, the feature matching with like in in feature inversion to kind of get this new thing called uh, neural style transfer, which uh, the child will explain. Yeah. Uh, we can use the same network. So, like, it's, it, it, in this case, uh, they use the pre chain like, uh, VGG network. Yeah. So you can like. So for the when you uh optimize the map. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought it's one texture image plus one context. That's one. Image. So it's actually one texture image plus a random noise. Ah okay. Yeah. So. so you use the. Can yeah. use the content. Content image meaning. Yeah, I guess for the tra style transfer. The oh. image the this one? This is the, the, the back propagated like uh gradient descent. So yeah, so I mean uh you com you compute the gram matrix for uh, the random noise, right? And then you to minimize the loss you need to to do some form of gradient descent and then it will basically transform this uh, noise image to the texture image that you want. <laughs> this, this image can be arbitrarily large because you are not even looking at the fully connected layers. So yeah, your texture can be arbitrarily large. Oh, so the one on the left is the, yeah, the noise image and the one on the right is the output? The one? <laughs> Should be your output. Oh yeah? I think that's the output after your gradient ascent. Because you compare, should be ascend, ascend right? Ascend, you're updating your. your yeah, yeah, it's a gradient descent. Uh, I think they might have flipped it around. Not sure. Yeah, I think this should be the right one is the output. Yeah, looks like the output. Yeah, I think that's that's most of it from the papers. Yeah. 
Yeah, so just now, uh, the texture synthesis and the feature reconstruction was introduced. And actually, we can combine these two methods together. And the method will be, the output will be uh, we combining the content from the content image and the style from the style image to generate, uh, to superimpose the style onto the content image. So that the output will be something like this. We're taking the style from the style image and taking the, the most of the objects from the content image and from these kind of uh, stylized uh, images. Uh, how to do that is basically combining the two methods uh, just introduced. We're taking, we have the style image and then we use the grand matrices to minimize the loss. And then we also have a content image. We use the feature reconstruction loss to minimize that loss. And actually we're combining the two losses together and then there will be some weights on the two losses. And then we also have an input image, which is just some noises. And in the process, in the multiple <coughs> process of forward um, propagation and backward propagation, we minimize the combination of these two losses. And then the output would be uh, the content image, image with the feed, uh, with the style from the style image. Yeah, with uh, several iterations, the output will look something like this. Uh, you can try different style image on the same content image, and the output will look different. <coughs> and just as like I mentioned, there will be uh, because we are combining the two loss functions. So actually, there's a the the hyper parameter, the the way to the the two loss functions that you can do uh, with different ways to the two separate two different loss functions. You will have different outputs. So one, you can see the the content clear and the other one you will see the the style stronger and another super par uh, <laughs> parameter is that uh, you can just simply changing the size of the style image you will have different output as well can you comment more about that why are those changing the size I think changing the size uh, during your style synthesis you have different uh, grand matrices and because by looking at you're minimizing your loss to the different uh, grand matrices then your neural network will be updating differently to the, the output to, to, to your uh, noise image that's why the style will look different when you feed in uh, different sizes of uh, style image i think basically it's because so the grand matrices your stride, would it also change the style or does that The style, uh, it's, it was not mentioned, and I didn't read through it. But I think it's, it's just cropping the image, the original image, to be smaller. Uh -huh. And when it is smaller, uh, the output will look different. The style, the grand matrices will be different. And when your network tries to learn that style, uh, it will memorize it as something slightly different. If the grand matrix does not depend on the resolution, right? It's not the resolution. It's no, how big the you're not seeing the full image now. It's cropping, like, you are only feeding part of that uh, style image to the network to get the grand matrices. Oh, I see. And... It makes sense, I mean, consistent with how uh, the texture synthesis was introduced, right? So, the Gavard filters, everything is sensitive to size. Yeah. And similar to Deep Dream, uh, we can use the multi-scale processing to process this kind of uh, feature transfer, and we will have like 4K images, uh, which is uh, super big, but and looks very pretty. But it takes a lot of time to process, and a lot of tough uh, computation. So these are the high-resolution pictures generated from the style transfer. It takes a few days to, to process. But the problem of this style transfer is that there are a lot of uh, forward propagation and backward propagation. So Justin came up with an idea of changing 
a network for doing the style transfer? Uh, so his idea was to, to change this uh, e-forward map. Uh, so we input this content image and the output <coughs> is something that uh, is the stylized image. During chaining, we still need this part. So during chaining, we still need this rigid part. And we, so we have this original image, right? And we'll have this uh, output, uh, the 2D stylized image. And then we input this one, and then do the, calculate the, the, what, the grand matrix loss and the feature reconstruction loss. And then we have this loss. We use this loss to update this feed-forward net, to update the weights in this feed-forward net. The losses, the loss is coming from this uh, pre-chain VGG uh, comp net. So we use this one and this output from this network as the input of this VGG net and uh, style images that we want to have. Like it can be any kind of style of image that we want to wait to be. Uh, with the yeah. Basically, you just use another network, and then you have the original image and the output image, and use, you use this one as the original input for what we just talked about uh, just now, and to get the losses, and use the loss to uh, use several provision to update the weights in this feed forward net. So it will try to memorize uh, both the style and the content. Uh, in this case, we will have to use a lot of content images to change this network, so that when you input a random uh, content image, it will try to uh, reconstruct whatever you can using the weight uh, chain in this process. So then you don't need to do uh, backward propag propagation when you try to restylize the image because the weights are updated during the training process. I, I, I think I just missed uh, some, something in, in this whole thing. Uh, what? Because you do this how to train and test, what is the difference between training and testing in this whole paradigm? Uh, I think I have a. Yeah, we never saw a slide like that. Okay. There's no I slide about it, but, but I, I read something online. Uh, so during the testing, there is no gram matrix calculation. Okay, I see. So uh, I think this one is kind of like a, maybe the network architecture is probably similar to a segmentation network. Uh -huh. Is it? Am I right? Yeah, it's, it's something like, like a that. Deconf yeah, kind of net, right? I want to show you a website, but I don't know how to get the browser there. Is it there? No, I thought this slide is about, okay, solving the speed of the stuff. I, I understood, but I'm now going back to how we started with strike transfer. The strike transfer is speed generation plus text transfer. Text transfer. Yeah, so the test is similar to the design. What is a summary of this image? So, and, that, and then the output is a texture. So uh, I think the style answer is saying that if you given two images, you want to make it so that the texture synthesis of the two images are the same. Texture synthesis plus feature inversion. I followed that. That's correct. It's like said that. Yeah. I mean, I'm following this correctly. So can Okay, that's all right. Let's do it. But I missed what what phase is training, what what is testing. In, in both uh, I think I think this is what happened during the training process. So you have the content images. Uh, okay. During training, we have a bunch of them, like like multiple of them, not just. And then uh, we are trying to change this network, the image uh, transformation network, and the output uh, instead of this one will be, uh, will be the like like the noise that we just feed in the what we just saw just now without it, without this chain network we are just feeding the noise and then it's content right to calculate the like the feature reconstruction loss and then the uh what the, the gram matrix loss in this case we are using this output from this network to calculate uh the the, the two losses that we, i just mentioned so and in this vgg network again we can use the, the method without this network to calculate the losses and use these losses we uh, use do some backward propagation to update the weights of this net 
network. So that this network will try to memorize both the content features and also the style features. So, so the style the features are the gram matrix, right? Yeah. yeah. So the, the content features are the different layers of the. Yeah, it depends on which layer you pick uh, in, in the VGG network. Okay. So the, yeah. style, the style part is your texture generation task. Right. The content part is your feature inversion task. So there is no inversion, right? It's just making the feature maps the same. There is no inversion, right? I think there's some. I mean, some part of inversion. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. I, I kind of think that the, the feature reconstruction can be. Is, is this some kind of feature inversion? It, it could be, right? Oh, wait. No, you no, 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 no. Okay, okay. there is. Yeah, there are two losses. Yeah, 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 two losses. But, but in, the, in the slide, I saw like, there's several losses, right? Okay, go back a few. Oh, like, like here? Ah, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> In, in the slides, they are like. <coughs> Next one? Uh, yeah, so the, the top one. Okay. So yeah. the style is actually, oh, so they one generate. Layer. Oh, because for gram matrices, you can calculate a per layer. Oh, and so then you oh, get, see, the, see, get, get some of the okay, losses. Okay, okay. So after chaining, uh, because the weights are memorized in the network, so you don't need to do the uh, backward propagation during uh, style transfer for a new image. Just the right arrow key. <coughs> yeah. So. This is the uh, like Justin showing how fast the the chain uh, style transfer can be. So, what how is the training set like? So you have uh, you have a style image. Is this is a tuple? Is it? It's a tuple with a particular sty uh, style image, yeah, you, a particular you have, image, and a particular noise. You have for chaining. Yeah, for chaining. No, for chaining, you have one style image, but a bunch of the what the content image? Oh, but the entire training set has just one yeah. style image. Yeah. So okay. you need to change the network per style. Per style one. Yeah, per style. Okay. Yeah. Now it's much clearer. So you mean that it means that you need to pre-generate the the target image. Uh, so you generate the content the image. Yeah. Because the, the generation is also slow, right? So now, now it's very clear. Right? So content so image only... are are some real images. It's not something that you generate. Okay, uh, no, yeah, no, no, no. The the, the out output you have to generate to get the output to feed into the train. Yeah, right? uh, the the output will be from this uh the, the network you try to train, the for a feed forward net. But you need to know the you need to know the target, right? So you need to use the uh, I mean to better, to train this feed forward net. Uh, you need to know what changes you need to make to the original content image. No, it is using no, no, no. several different content images. Yeah. Right? So it's trying to, people are learning, uh, network is just trying to learn the style. Exactly. Right? That's so the you is. use several different content images and you stylize them. Yeah. So uh, by creating the people network over many different content images, the, the content information is being washed out. Yeah. Right? You're left with just the style transfer and the people are doing. So that means later when you introduce a new target, you can get it to stylize because it's only retain the memory of the style, not retain the memory of the content, because you have many different content images. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, okay. In other words, so that's but but the output of the feed for net is an image, right? It's not style. It's an image. It's, it's an a image, stylized it's a image. To transfer a so uh, style. I understand. So so, but my question is, uh, do they uh, because? To train a neural network, you need to like go iterate to Apple, right? So you have like training data set, but uh, today, uh, so my question is actually. So a training data set is one style image. So okay, yeah. Add with several content images. But do, do, do they regenerate the every time? Because yeah. when, when yeah. it misses, so, during, during, during the training phase, it, mm. the target is to regenerate uh, a stylized version of that content image. So every time the same image is encountered, it doesn't need to be done, right? It can be pre computed. 
So you are, you are basically what you are trying to do is you are learning the gram matrices for that particular texture. That's your training. That, that's the that's what training is. But the owner has no notion of gram matrices, right? Okay. So so yes, no. You just you it, remember. It just remember. It updates the the weights to backward propagation because you calculate you calculate the loss. Oh, so this during is the training process. This is, a, this is an improvement. Okay. Before the, the normal thing, before the fast file transfer. Yeah. In normal file file transfer, what happens? No, normal. Yeah. Network for normal file transfer. Yeah. Normal. So here, uh, during training phase. Right. I think I don't think there's a training process for the uh, normal then, one. No, I understand what goes on in the normal one, but uh, normal one there is no training process. There's no training process. This one is a pre pre chain DGG network. Okay. So you use this one. Uh, what happens is that you you feed in the style image and mm -hmm. the content image, and then because the weights are pre chain right? So you you only use that to get the the gram matrices for the style image. So you, you only do the for propagation part. You use it to get the gram images. And you use this one to get the feature vector. It depends on which layer you pick. And then and then you, you give you feed in some noise image. And then you also get the the the, the, the gram matrices and you also get the feature vector. And you try to use the two loss functions to you, you try to minimize the two loss functions. Right. And then you update the, the noise image. Get out. Okay. Yeah. So this. So. There's no, no training. So we're we only updating the the noise image. So in the improved version, so this generation of the training, only needs to be done once, correct? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So and then late, later on, when the same image is uncovered, you just use a we use a already finished. Yeah. After like training, one. you can you can forget this part. You can you just use the mm -hmm. info and that. Yeah. Because you use this uh. You use, you use this VGG just to change the weight in this people one net. So how I understand the difference between sound, normal sound transfer and fast sound transfer is that normal sound transfer you have to have one network for one one content image. For each content image and the sound image. No, no, no. You don't need a network. network. No, this is the fast sound transfer. The normal sound transfer. In normal yeah, style transfer, well, you use the same network, but just that you need to calculate yeah, multiple calculate times. Yeah. Many times yeah. 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 So true. for each image, you have to back up a lot yeah. of times. Yeah. Whereas for this fast style transfer, you just need to feed forward one time and you can get it out. Yeah, after chaining it. Yeah, after chaining Using it. the chain model. I, yeah. I have one question. The architecture of this feed forward network, does it need to be the same as the original? Uh, original no. meaning. But so what guarantees the block, that the blog post is quite quite specific about this under the diagram that was shown? You it has a couple paragraphs. But, but yeah, basically the idea is the same here. You're trying to use this uh, train the speed forward network to incorporate a style. You train that by feeding multiple content images through, so the content gets washed away, and you just leave a with the style that's uh, transferred. It's, it's fast because you're only doing one feed forward to pass, right? You just have the image, and you feed it forward, and then out pops another image that has the style. That right. you take. So it means that the architecture can be just a small network and it can stylize anything. Yeah. I see. So I think they say it's uh, got three convolution layers, and, and uh, yeah, not, it's not very large. There's a diagram underneath the in the blog post. It's got a couple. Uh, yeah. You can see the image transformation. So just go down. That's your network. I see. I see. So then your feed forward testing networks. Yeah. Okay. After stream. Let's apply that. That's that's pretty fast because it's not very deep. Um and then you get that when you get that. Can you study? Um.
how to, how to get that into the slides. <laughs> Uh, so uh, this is what uh, Justin did, and at the same time there was some Russian guy did the same thing. I think the only difference is that uh, instead of uh, some batch normalization, uh, that guy used some instance normalization, and doing so uh, actually improves the results. This is the paper. Yeah, uh, there are two papers. One is from Justin, and one is from this guy. I think. Uh, Using similar techniques, you can actually try to chain one network many styles. Uh, many styles just meaning you get multiple uh, gram matrices and try to minimize that loss. Yeah. So with one network, you can have a, a lot of inputs and a lot of matrices or even uh, multiple feature reconstruction losses. Yeah, that's pretty much it. It, does it mean that it outputs multiple images at the same time? I think. Or you have to specify what image you want somehow. I think it depends on your fee forward network. If you if you uh, mix all the style together, then you will only have one output so of the mixed features. Oh, and okay. yeah, if you want to have different style, then you need to change different network. Because because during training. Uh, the style image, there's only one, only one style. Okay. Image of only one style. But the output can be trained to output multiple channels, right? Multiple channels. Uh, so that it outputs you, you mean RBG, style at the uh, same time. I mean, a few set of RBGs. What I imagine is instead of just one style vector, you get it's a vector of the style vectors. So doing your feed for you just somehow like combine the style one with the content one and get your final result. Okay. So you get I'm saying different networks in the same way. Yeah. Because uh style transfer. I think there's something but it says one network many styles. One network. Yeah. I mean, yeah, how, how they are doing it? Still, uh, there's a different paper, right? There's a different paper. Yeah, this is, I, I see an article. You don't, you don't talk about this paper, that video? No. Let's go with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is a major breakthrough. We should have been in ICM. That was the best number of the streets. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. So you go to two point one, they tell you some some intuition, right? So they, they say that um, you know, all the styles probably share some basis. Uh, so you don't want to just train all of the N networks separately because um, you know you're you're losing information that is shared between different types of styles. Mm -hmm. Right. So what they're trying to do is is model that conditionally. Um, by saying that uh, each style is uh, some, some basic style and then uh, using scaling and shifting to, to um, express a specific type of style. So, a painting style is not a fast fish. Yeah. I'm saying correctly. Yeah. Fast fish. Yeah. Is there any people that can generate that can train this for any style? Um, for any because right now it's limited to ten styles. The previous one is limited to one style. But it seems possible to generate for any styles, right? Because right now I think the problem is the uh, the training procedure is very slow right now. So let's say you have a new stuff, you must train it first. Yeah. But is it possible to somehow represent the style in some way and then just update the network on the fly? So you only need one type. Yeah. Like it should be, it should be possible, right? To do some, maybe you can decompose a style into like a, a global style thing. And then some local style that can be done faster. Yeah, kind of. So I imagine that I mean, you have pre Yeah, Maybe so there's a pre uh, yeah, 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 kind of. So like you have a kind of a you, you train the slow like one. That. The slow one is kind of think of it as an image net, right. and then you have a style image, mm -hmm. and then you extract some style, style things, component of it, and then transfer yeah. it onto the image net. Yeah, seems possible. It's possible. Yeah. So some type of online algorithm is going to be some batch update. No, no, it's um at training time. Yeah, yeah on training time. Uh so yes, in the training time phase, uh, it learns some global representation of what a style is. And then during the testing time, you specify a style, and then it will extract that style and apply it to the learned model. Mm -hmm. And then you and then after that it can generate the new style. So there is no training involved anymore. You just need to extract once. From a given style image, I think it's mentioned in the paper. To one way to incorporate a new style is to train a 
change that. Right? Yeah. There's some parameter you can tune to learn a new set of gamma and beta parameters. But to learn a new set of what? Yeah. You, you still need to train with complete images, right? Mm. It seems. There's some trade off, but it's comparable. But even then, they still need the full range to learn the new language, right? Okay, so yeah. it's faster, really, right? Yeah. It's faster. They're not going to learn other ways. Yeah. It's only about tuning the gamma and beta parameter. Yeah, but it's still learning, the gamma and learning the gamma and beta parameter instead of the, instead of the weights from scratch. That's fine. But you still need the images, right? To learn it. Like full like image net images. To learn those. Am I right? No, so, so, so my goal is like, okay, I want to download this model on a mobile phone. Mm -hmm. And then there's no way you can possibly learn a new style transfer on a mobile phone, right? So, uh, so then I have some global which is a universal style model and then you learn on the fly it's from a single image and then apply it to the universal model oh, so actually what you want is this so you have a pre-trained Einstein model that they have and you want to update this to a new style, style image yeah. that you're going to import yes. yeah. yeah so uh, no so the term is not doing that no. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. For those, like when this house and so it's the way it's going to like you take in a new image in the environment and then you pass it through and then you apply the particular style to it and then you pass it through and then you pass I think, yeah, so yeah. What, what, how I understand it is that he has a new image that has yeah. some style component. Uh -huh. uh, you need to update the existing pre frame style method. Yeah. Uh, yeah and then, and then, no, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> don't know. I think that's a bit of a But I understand that's your idea. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what I mean. Yeah. So that's, that, 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 that'll be online version. But but no, it's, no it's not really online because it's just no, just one made. one image. Sure. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but okay. the model is updated. Correct, correct, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 Okay, so um, I guess that's it for today's presentation. Let's thank our speaker. Week we have um, our generative model uh, based on RNN and CNN variation model encoders and generative adversarial models. And then after class, we are going to turn to the uh, OBAR uh, at the uh, Guildhouse.